1923 was not long ago. As you roll back the clock, it's surprising how quickly you arrive at a past which looks unfamiliar. A past in black and white, photographs are only drawings, small stories and snippets of excitement, a time which looks archaic or in its infancy to modern eyes. Most associate anything before their own time or perhaps their parents' time as vintage, antique. We're coming up on a hundred years since the 1923 French Grand Prix, 98 to be exact. And although that may feel like a long time ago, it was only three or four generations before us. A time between the two world wars, a time when the automobile was rapidly developing, a time when Grand Prix racing was an exciting new novelty. Time seems to pass faster and faster every year, but 1923 was not too long ago. For most of you watching, it may have been your great-grandparents or even your grandparents who were there to experience it. You may have even known these people in your childhood, or maybe you were fortunate enough to hear their stories directly from them. 1923 was not too long ago. User Nice Cup of Tea has been working for the past two years on the Grand Prix cars of the 1923 French Grand Prix. Starting in September 2019 with the odd tank-shaped Bugatti Type 32, each car has been painstakingly researched and recreated for Assetto Corsa in stunning detail. In the French Grand Prix of 1923, there were six different vehicles and 17 total starters. The race held on a triangle circuit outside of Tours, France, was won by Brit Henry Seagrave, driving the reliable six-cylinder Sunbeam Grand Prix. It finished alongside the aforementioned Bugatti, as well as the oddly shaped aviation-inspired Foisson C6 Laboratory. Perhaps the fastest car, the Fiat 805 405, had been the likely winner of the event. It was the first supercharged car in Grand Prix racing. The three entrants from the Fiat factory literally, but one by one dropped out of the race with mechanical difficulties, all too common in the experimental push for speed. The fifth car, the Delange 2 LCV, exemplified this rapid development and sported the first V12 racing engine in its sole entry in the race. Piloted by the experienced René Thomas, it too retired after leading some of the early laps of the Grand Prix. And so finally, the sixth and final car which competed in the 1923 French Grand Prix has been finished, completing the full 17 car grid, and to my knowledge, creating the first full set of Grand Prix cars from this era. The car is the Roland Pillion A22. The A22 is perhaps not the grand finale some might have expected. Its place as the last car to be developed by Nice Cup of Tea owes itself only to being the most obscure. Roland Pillion was a small French auto manufacturer founded in 1905, a joint venture between successful businessman Francois Roland and family-trained auto mechanic Emily Pillion. The company, like most of the time, built road-going automobiles and race cars on the side. Perhaps Roland Pillion's greatest claim to fame as an auto manufacturer was the development of the first hydraulic brakes a method which became standard in later years, but was initially scoffed at by its perceived delicate design alongside the hefty steel cables and standard drums of the day. The A22 was over a year old by the time it competed at Tours in 1923. Fitted with a straight eight outputting 97 horsepower, it was the second lowest powered car on the grid, only behind the exceedingly light Fosson. And it was the heaviest car by nearly 100 kilograms. Three entries were planned for the French Grand Prix. Two entries piloted by Albert Guyot and Victor Omri made the grid, but one experimental entry for Indianapolis 500 winner Jules Gou with a six-cylinder was planned, but never started after difficulties in practice. The A22 made no impression in tours, but just three weeks later it won the inaugural San Sebastian Grand Prix in Spain, one of Roland Pillion's earliest and greatest successes in motorsports. So I'm sitting here in the cockpit of the A22 at Goodwood Circuit, and firstly, just listen to the engine on this thing.
Nice Cup of Tea is very modest about the sounds. He's actually recently released the Fiat again with an updated sound set and uh, admittedly talks about how this car itself doesn't have the greatest sounds in his opinion, but I think it sounds pretty good. And uh, for a car that you wouldn't exactly be able to go record, I can't think of anything much better. But I'll actually go out and want to do a couple laps of the circuit and just talk about how this car drives a bit. So I alluded to it in the intro, this is absolutely not the best performing car of the set. It's probably the worst actually and shift up to second it's just a three speed um, and so you spend a lot of time between second and third gears just helping balance the car uh, and it seems to not want to actually get up in revs in third gear you'd have to have a pretty fast circuit to actually do that uh, but flat out now we'll head down towards st mary's here at goodwood likes to shift maybe around 5400 rpm i've found will rev as high all the way up to 6000 though i'm sure you wouldn't want to do that in the actual race but we'll come down here and set it up for st mary's trying not to go wide on cold tires or whatever heat these tires could actually get in them another 90 degree right hander like the rest of the cars in this set i've talked about this in in all the different videos i've done on these so far but they're amazingly drivable and it's this sweet spot in grand prix or racing car history where even though the tires and brakes are terrible by modern standards the engines were almost equally as terrible or they're really starting to get a little more powerful but they're still pretty low powered so everything kind of works together once you calibrate yourself for this kind of car as we'll come to the end of the circus probably the most challenging spot on it once you calibrate yourself towards this type of car and get the speed under control, make sure you're doing the proper braking distances, these, these cars are amazingly drivable and I really recommend them for anybody interested in older racing cars. I actually think the cars of the 50s and 60s are much harder to drive because although tires and suspension and brakes did develop quite a lot between the 1920s and 1950s, engines sure developed a lot more. So uh, the engines really outpaced the mechanics of the car for quite a long time and so they're really hard to drive you'll find yourself oversteering just on throttle these cars you can flat foot pretty easily uh, drift around corners pretty easily and it all feels like it comes together quite nice second for St. Mary's here. Try not to run too wide, slide the tires a little bit. We'll say this car is probably the hardest out of the lot to actually slide and drift and, and get control of. I think that's just the extra weight that this one has. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of horsepower. It's gonna run a little wide here to help steer you out of it. But on a track like this, this is a pretty easy car to drive once you get the braking distances right. This, of course, a much smoother track than would have been had in 1923. Uh, they would have mostly been racing on dirt actually back then. Uh, so really interesting to see the development of these cars. And this being the sixth of this set, I think the best thing about this is that you can experience all of the different cars from the period. Very often we have mods come out. It's a brick quite early here. Just get the car slowed down. Quite, quite often we have mods and cars come out that are just one singular car from a period. And they're often great. I love very high quality car mods and things that let you experience a specific car. But having a full set of cars uh, and all the different ones that competed in a race, you can experience all the different types of cars and it helps contextualize just how diverse motorsport was. If this was the only car available for this race, I'll come pull, up, pull the car over up here. If the Roland Pillion here was the only car available for the race, we wouldn't know any different 
driving it around that it was the slowest or handled this way because it had maybe some undesirable traits. But comparing it directly to the Fiat or the Sunbeam, uh, you get a sense why this car maybe wasn't as good or what the development had been in the year since this car was, was new. So I think comparing the cars themselves to one another, driving all of them and seeing what their quirks are, uh, even though the physics from Nice Cup of Tea's explanations, it's all a little bit of guesswork. The clear documentation on all these cars doesn't exist, but I have faith that they've been done very well together. So what I want to do instead of doing a race, and I'll do more races in the future, but I want to do a little competition with these cars uh, one-on-one to figure out which one is the quickest and maybe what are some of the different handling characteristics between them. So for a little bit of competition, I figured we could do a hill climb event. Hill climbs themselves were extremely popular in the early days of motorsports, still are today, but it was one of the premier types of motorsport. And one of the hill climbs that still exists, even though it's not the most competitive, is the Goodwood Hill Climb. And I figured this could be a cool venue to try out some of these cars, since this might be one of the only places that you could see any of these today. But the Goodwood Hill Climb itself, of course, is the hill climb that's used in the famous historic event. Most commonly, you see cars just kind of pacing themselves up it and then there'll be a small class of cars that actually try to race up it but it's just over a mile and this amazing rendition of it has been made for a set of course up by gunner 333 over at race department and it's based off scan data and aerial photos and all of the objects and everything look amazing it's quite a short circuit so i guess you can put ultra detail into it but uh, it looks like you're there when you're driving this so it's uh, an amazing one to show off i'm actually surprised i haven't done anything here yet so i want to take each of the 1923 Grand Prix cars up the hill climb twice just so we can get a good uh, sense of time and I'll take the quickest time from each car and we'll just get a sense uh, through that which one's the quickest obviously but also some of the driving quirks it's a short course but we'll be able to feel out a little bit what makes each of these cars unique So to start with, I figure I'll just do these in the order that Nice Cup of Tea released them. Start with the Bugatti Type 32. This is the streamlined little bullet shaped car. Um, the streamlined bodywork actually created lift on the car, so it wasn't quite as, as good as it looked. But for its time especially, it was very slippery through the air. One of the heaviest cars because of the extra bodywork, it weighs uh, a little over 750 kilograms. So it's the second heaviest, only behind our Roland Pillion that we were just discussing. Has a pretty powerful engine though, the two liter I-8 with 100 horsepower. So uh, decently powered, but quite heavy. So for a track like this, I'm not expecting this one to set off any records, but it will be the one we set the baseline with. All right, so just rolling out of the pits and we'll come towards the start line. This is where we'd want to be warming the tires. And of course, we're going to be on cold tires for these runs, but they'll all be equal. So we'll come up to the start line. We've got a couple marshals sitting here. We'll go off of the guy on the right with his hand. Uh, he'll do a little salute. When he drops his hand, we'll go off the line. And then the timer will start. There we go. Away we go with the Bugatti. Come down the start straight. It's a three-speed car, so we'll get up into second gear here, the backfire of the engine. Come down towards the first right-hander. Just try not to run wide. It'd be embarrassing if you're racing a classic car here and you run off the circuit in the first corner. Second corner, not quite so easy. Dip it on the grass there. Ooh, a little jump on the asphalt. Now probably the fastest section of the circuit, the park straight. Get up to third gear here for just a second. Now need to spot our entry for the next corner. There we go down to second gear, try to slide it in, put on a little show for the spectators. See the shadow of the helicopter there go past, right up to the edge through Mulcomb there. And now always see the guys try to push hard through this section, right up to the wall, the flint wall here on the inside. Try not to clip it at all. Come through deceptively difficult right-hander. Ooh, slide the back end of the car. Luckily to keep it out of all the hay bales. Only protect us somewhat, but now flat out, just one little right-hand corner here. I told you it was a quick little run up the hill. Keep it in second gear. Just enough time for third for a second there. Oh, big kick back over the line. But a 111.963, so not a bad run up the hill. I felt like I actually pushed the car just enough and used enough of the track, but a 111.963 will be our baseline. Run number one for the Bugatti. Let's line up and do it again. All 
right, so we'll come back towards the start line. And a 111 963, it's actually pretty good. I've done a bunch of different cars up the hill here, and uh, it's actually a pretty impressive time. So I'm eager to see how this compares to all the other cars. We'll come to the start finish line, though, and wait for our buddy here on the right to uh, raise his hand. We'll call him Jeffrey. Get the car revving, though. No tachometer, so just kind of guessing. Hands up, down, we're underway. Oh, a little bit of a burnout this time, a little bit faster acceleration away up to second gear. Bogs down a bit, but these cars, only three gears in this car, which was standard at the time. Come through the first corner, run a little bit wide, not too bad. Try to clip the second one. Gotta watch out for the hop in the pavement, though, as we rejoin. <laughs> Get a little airborne that time. Now on the park straight, flat out. Up to third gear. We'll come past all the little boards here. So easy to run wide on this corner. It's so tough. Down to second gear. Don't want to push it too deep. Oh, we'll slide the car. That'll be a little slower, I think. But so tricky to get the braking through Molcom there. Come to the Flint wall, though. Still second gear. We'll just let off the gas for just a second. Back in it. Try not to clip the wall on the inside. Through the right-hander. A little less dramatic this time, but shaving the hay bales on the right, but now up the hill, the run towards the finish line. Get up to third gear a little earlier, so I got a higher speed this time, I think. Come across the line, whoa, 111.3, five two, so that's quicker. It's quicker, about six tenths, wow. So it shows you just a couple runs get you quicker, but we'll do two runs in each car. I think it'll be pretty fair. Uh, but overall, the Bugatti here, it's actually very nimble for how heavy it is. Uh, and I almost feel like it's a little easier to control just because of the extra weight that the car has. Still enough power in the engine though uh, to help push it along quite well. So it's one of the most enjoyable ones to drive and I can see why it was you know, decently successful in the French Grand Prix, but we'll come up here and park it overall. So officially a 111.352 for the Bugatti Type 32. A uh, fun car to drive, I recommend this one. I'm actually surprised at how quick it is and we'll see how it compares in the whole list, but this is a really good car in a fast straight line, uh, but surprisingly nimble, short wheelbase, with a good amount of speed even though it's heavy. So a great showing from the Bugatti. So now we move on to the Voisson C6, and this is absolutely the oddest looking car of the bunch. But if you remember, this was built by an airplane manufacturer with aeronautic sensibilities. Uh, and so it's ultra light. I think it only weighs something like 660 uh, kilograms, which is way lighter than everything else. Uh, it has a lot less horsepower to it. It's a six cylinder engine, 78 horsepower. So not a lot of power, but it's, it's very light. An interesting design where the front axle is a lot wider than the rear. We even got a little propeller on the front, which doesn't uh, propel the car at all, but it does cool the car. So it's very interesting automobile overall. So eager to see how this does on a hill climb. I actually think this might be one of the most competitive cars on a hill climb just because of uh, the traction and the wide stance that it has, but we'll have to see. All right, so we'll roll forward towards the line here at the start. We'll wait for Jeffrey here to give us the wave off. Might do it a little too soon. Come and park down. Oh, he's already raising his hand. Away we go. Come across the line. Clock starts. All right, get it up to second gears. Rev's pretty low, only 4,500 RPMs where you want to shift. Come down to the first corner, try not to blow it. Rear end kicks in nice. Oh, she feels good around the curve. We'll come to the second corner. Just get that right wheel on the grass and it kicks the car up as you come over the tarmac there. We're 4,000 RPM up to third. Moving right along now. We'll just spot the entry to welcome here. Down to second gear. Try not to run wide, get the car turned in. A lot of lateral grip in this car. Oh, it's right in the grass, right on the edge, but a lot of lateral grip compared to some of the other cars. You can really turn the car quite well. we'll come up to the wall though. Have to watch, it's very narrow road and most of these cars are pretty narrow, but even for this one, a little bit of lift of the gas there as we'll come up to the right-hander. A little bit of oversteer coming out of it. Now flat foot up the rest of the hill. It's not super steep here, but you can tell the engine has to work a little harder as we'll come towards the finish line up to third gear right at the end. Come across.
across the line. Oh, and a 111.949. So almost a dead heat with the first time I did in the Bugatti. So very, very close overall. I'm actually surprised in that. I don't think that was quite as good of a run up the hill though. So eager to try a second attempt at this. So rolling towards the start finish line interested to see how this one does on the second run since I approved so much with the Bugatti the first time around interested if the uh, Voissant is the same way, but we'll have to see We'll park it here and wait for our friend there on the right to raise his hand Actually have a tachometer in this car fist is up down lower underway bogged down slightly But the timer didn't start till I got to the line now up to the revs second gear Try to get it in for the first corner. Nice run through there, a little bit of oversteer on the exit, but not too bad. Come to the second corner, try to cut it a little bit, maybe a lot, a little bit of a wheel hop as we get back on the pavement. We can afford that in a very short event under the Goodwood Bridge here, flat out third gear. And just try to plan our entry into Mulcombe. Down to second gear. Oh, using all the pavement but a little bit better run through there this time we'll come towards the flint wall second gear I'll just wait to shift it up we don't need to do it so we gotta let off the throttle there Whoa, clipping almost the hay bales I'm sure there'd be a little bit of hay dust behind me up to the right hander here it was maxed out in second gear but didn't want to lose the time for a shift but now flat out as we got through the little kink flat through this left hander up to third gear quite early so i think i'm carrying quite a lot of speed come to the line whoa the time looks pretty good wow 110.2 so <laughs> almost a second quicker than bugatti so definitely driving uh, is a lot better so there's gonna be a lot of variance in this i'm sure folks will spot out where i was better with one car than the other so it may look odd, but it definitely has got it where it counts. I, I knew the Vuitton was going to be pretty good just because of the distribution of weight and how light it is for this type of event uh, where every car is similar in horsepower, even though this is by far the least horsepower car, uh, having it be so light and, and a good amount of grip for the cars, I think was going to pay off. So a 110.225 firmly puts it in the lead. Uh, we'll have to see if any of the other cars can beat it on a circuit like this. I'm not too sure. And now to the third car, the actual winner of the 1923 French Grand Prix, Sunbeam Grand Prix car. And Sunbeam themselves put out a lot of different cars. Each Sunbeam Grand Prix car actually existed for quite a few years. This is most closely related to the 1923 variant. This is a great Grand Prix car, and I think looks a lot like what you'd expect a Grand Prix car to look like. So it certainly was a blueprint somewhat for what Grand Prix cars would look like in the future. Uh, and that's why it looks more similar or common to us these days. But it's a great car statistically. It had a six-cylinder engine, 108 horsepower. So quite a lot more power uh, than the Voisson we were just driving with 78, uh, but a little bit, just a little bit more than the Bugatti. But the weight is really really where it counts, 674 uh, kilograms, which is just 15 more or so from uh, the Voisson. So I was talking about how light that car was. This car is almost just as light. I think the big difference here is the weight distribution. Uh, you can see how high the driver sits in this, and you'll see when, when driving, you sit much higher. So doesn't really have that low to the ground uh, like the Voisson had. So I'm interested to see how it does up the mountain, but it's got more horsepower. It's got not much more weight. So we'll have to see how well she does. All right, but we'll come to the start line here in the Sunbeam. This is one of the most fun cars to drive in the set, I think. It's a very well-rounded car, but we'll have to see how good it is up a hill climb. Wait for the hand signal here. Just to the right, hand is up, down. We're underway over the yard of bricks at the start line. Never noticed that before, but oh, flat out. Caught to second gear and head down to the first corner. Get here pretty quickly. Even in a car from 1923, a little bit wide through there, but carried some speed. Try to cut the corner a little bit through the second one. <laughs> Hop on the asphalt. It's going to get me every time. But now flat out, we'll look for third gear here as we go under the Goodwood Bridge. Oh, she shifts quite late. Just enough time to get up to third. Back down to second for Molcombe. Oh, I got on the gas early there. A little uncomfortable with the car through there. Definitely would be hesitant to push in real life, but coming to Flint now. 
just guide it on in. You can definitely feel the center of gravity is way higher in this car. It just kind of rocks to the sides, come through the right hander. Doesn't feel quite like you can plant it in the corners. You gotta make up your mind with the corner much sooner. But now flat towards the finish line already, up the end of the hill. We'll keep it in second here all the way to the finish. Oh, and a 107.9. So even though driving it felt slower, and some of that might be the position actually, driving just being so high up uh, doesn't feel quite as fast but wow a 107.9 so we're already much much quicker than both of the other cars i think it's got to be the horsepower and weight even though the mechanics and the steering of this car aren't quite as good all right so we'll roll down towards the start line to do the second lap and um so quick on the first one. I'm interested to see if I can actually back that up or if I was just really good through that one pass, but pump to the start line, wait for the hand signal here. Hand is up, down, we're underway. Oh, and a healthy burnout away from the line. Get it up to second gear. Try to spot the entry for the first corner. Get it a little bit better this time, hopefully. Oh, still running a little bit wide onto the grass slightly, but we'll get our foot flat in it. Won't lose too much time. Cut the second one, clip the asphalt there. Now flat on the straightaway towards the Goodwood Bridge. We'll just get third gear by the end of this straightaway. Not almost enough time to shift up, but we'll do it. Third gear, now heavy on the brakes to Molcom. The brakes actually work quite nicely in this car. Definitely better than the Vuitton or Bugatti. But now second gear towards Flint. Very intimidating staring at that wall. I can't imagine taking a priceless automobile this fast towards a wall like that. And now right-hander, second gear, just ease it on in, back on the throttle halfway through the corner. Much nicer that time. This might even be quicker, I don't know, but flat out towards the hill, just easily around the left-hander. Keep it in second, won't need to shift across the line. Oh, and a 107 flat, 107.95, so, or 095, so 107 flat, even further. Man, almost a second quicker than the last one was, 9 tenths. So uh, this car's got a lot of speed in it, um, and way faster, even though it doesn't feel like you're driving as fast, like I said, first time around, but certainly a very quick car. So I definitely wouldn't have predicted that, but the Sunbeam is awesome on the hill climb. I think this car actually did a lot of hill climbs, so it makes sense. Um, but yeah, even though you're sitting way high up in the car and the weight distribution is definitely more awkward than something like the Vuisson, uh, the extra horsepower, I guess, with 108 horsepower or thereabouts uh, is just a great combination with the light light uh, frame of body and everything. So uh, this car obviously won the French Grand Prix. It was a little bit out of attrition. So I'm optimistic now that we move to the last few cars that we still might beat the time. But a 107.095 is awful quick up the hill. All right, and I know a lot of folks been waiting for this one. I think this is gonna be one of the more interesting runs up the hill. The Fiat 805 405, the first supercharged Grand Prix car. Uh, this car itself, it weighs just about as much as the Sunbeam does. Very similar configuration too, still sitting up high, not quite as high, but still up pretty high. But of course, the interesting feature of this car is the inline eight that outputs out 135 horsepower supercharged, of course. So expecting big things from the power department, it's all gonna be about handling. Uh, if the Sunbeam was this quick up the hill with the weight it has, since this car weighs about the same, uh, we'll have to see how it corners. But the Fiat, I think will be one of the quicker cars, uh, if not the quickest. So let's try it out. All right, we'll roll towards the start finish line. I mentioned in the intro that the Fiat itself uh, has a new sound pack. It was just released by a Nice Cup of Tea. So if you haven't updated or downloaded the mod in a while, definitely go do that. As you can hear, it sounds amazing. But we'll come to the start line, park it, wait for Jeffrey here on the right. Fist is up, down, we're underway. A little bit slower off the line, but a lot of wheel spin. Get it up to second gear. The wheels kind of squabble a little bit. You can tell it has that little bit more horsepower. Come down to the first corner, try to pitch it in nice. Ooh, she grabs the apex pretty good. A little bit wide there, but now come through the second bend. <laughs> Clipping the asphalt, flat out second gear. A lot of oversteer already up to third gear. This car actually has a four speed. Uh, I don't 
don't think we'll use fourth on the hill here, but firmly in third. Come down then to Molcom, test out the brakes, second gear. Ooh, on the inside, try not to run wide. It's a little late on the throttle, on the grass. Up to third gears, we'll come towards Flint. Haven't shifted there yet in any of the cars. Come back down to second for the run around Flint. Back up to third now. A lot more active driving this one. Right out to the edge of the wall. But now flat out towards the line. Up to third, letting it rev all the way up. And we'll come to the line. Third gear still flat out. Oh, and a 107.1. That was definitely not the best run either, but just a little bit slower than the Sunbeam so far. This car is a lot more dramatic to drive. I think you can see how much it moves around under acceleration compared to the other, other ones. You can really flat foot those cars without any hesitation. This one might give a thought or two uh, to the throttle pedal each time you use it, but a quick car, I think I can go a bit quicker though. So rolling to the start line. Interested to see if I can keep control of the car a bit more, just be a little bit more precise if it's uh, quicker overall, because it's definitely a little bit holding on last time. All right, hand is up, down, we're underway. A little bit of wheel spin off the line, try to control that, get a good run away. Don't want to lose time there, just spinning the wheels with all the horsepower. But come down to the first corner, gripped up nicely through here last time. Quite the same this time, a little bit of understeer, but still nice run through there. Come to the second corner, just nose it on in. Handles the bumps quite well, up to third gear then. Under the Goodwood Bridge, flat out. Almost want to grab fourth here, but not quite enough time. Get down to second gear. Come into Molcom. Right up to the edge of the grass, but ooh, on the accelerator. A little bit of wheel spin. Up to third gear. Come up to Flint. Keep it in third through here. Oh, it feels so fast through there. Quite scary. to the edge, right to the hay bales, almost clipping the left side, but now flat towards the line. Let's see if this is at all quicker. It certainly feels a little bit more composed than the first run, but it can be deceptive. Come to the line, yeah, 106.839. So just a few tenths. So the first one run wasn't that far off, but that felt a lot more composed, um, almost wide into the hay bales there through the second to last corner. But man, supercharging when the scientists at Fiat discovered that and um, put it in a Grand Prix car. They must have thought to themselves, wow, we really have the answer here uh, because for quite a little while there, they were miles ahead in the power department. So we just keep going faster and faster down to a 106.839 uh, sitting first up there with the Fiat. The power itself, since it's the same weight, very similar configuration of the Sunbeam, I could only have guessed that it would be uh, a faster car, but it's a lot more to control. Uh, I think, hopefully you can tell through the video that it's not as easy to drive as the other cars. Still quite easy to drive compared to higher powered cars of the future, but to me, this car is a great balance of the power and mechanical grip. Uh, it's just enough where you can get the rear end loose and you can slide the car on acceleration, spin the spin the wheels, but it's not so dramatic like the 50s Grand Prix cars are where you're really holding on for dear life whenever you go in the braking zone. Uh, so if you were to pick a car, in my opinion, this might be the one to drive, but it could also be the next one. Let's do it. If there was a beauty contest, the Delange 2 LCV would certainly win it for me. It's such a beautiful car. I love the way the bodywork comes to a point in the back. It's a little more lower slung, especially than the Sunbeam, but about the same as the Fiat uh, and a V12 engine. It's definitely a great car. Now, it's a little heavy uh, compared to the rest of the cars, about 20 kilograms, 25 kilograms more than the Fiat and the Sun Sunbeam, maybe 30 or so. So... It is, it is a heavier car. It has less horsepower uh, than the Fiat, of course, just because it's not supercharged. Uh, it's just got a regular V12, but it was the first V12 engine, uh, and so it wins a little bit for that. Definitely more power than the Sunbeam has. So we'll see how it does. Um, maybe it'll be the right balance, and the steering and everything will just propel us to the top of the charts. 
All right, so rolling towards the start line. This car, it's just so gorgeous to me. It's definitely the one I would pick if I had to pick any of them, but we'll see how quickly it can actually get up the hill. Stop here at the start line. Wait for Jeffrey here to flag us off. Hand is up, down, we're underway. Come across the line, ooh, a healthy amount of wheel spin. And the rear end breaks loose a little bit, so there's a lot of power there with the V12. Up to second gear, come down to the first corner. Let's see how she steers right into the apex. Running slightly wide on the exit, but I carried a lot of speed. Come to the second corner. Just dipped off the gas for a second. I was actually able to get through there quite well, so I think this car has got a lot of handling characteristics. Ooh, I'm gonna touch the dirt on the left. Up to third gear now, flat. Just trying to spot a braking for Molcom, see how good the brakes are. Come into the left-hander once again early on the accelerator and flat towards Flint. Second gear will run it all the way up to 55 RPMs, 5500. Don't have to worry about preserving the V12 here. I'll come to the kink, turn it in a little late. I can tell it grips up quite well, but ooh, a lot of oversteer on exit. Waggles back and forth, we'll lose a little bit of speed there, but now towards the line, we'll get it up to third gear around the corner and see the finish line in front. How quick is it gonna be? Oh, and a 107.4, so just a little slower than the Fiat was uh, the first time through. I think I can do a little bit better than that. It felt a little squirrely through some corners, but firmly ahead of the Sunbeam, uh, the Sunbeam's first run. So right now, sitting third, uh, can I get the Delange up to second or even first? I'm not sure, but let's try another run at it. All right, so I think on this run, if I'm a little less dramatic, just keep it in a straight line a little bit better. Uh, it'll be pretty quick, but we'll have to see. All right, waiting at the line. Hand is up, down, we're underway. Try to nix the wheel spin off the line. Don't want that to slow me down. Shift up to second gear, head towards the first corner. Try to brake a little bit early, don't want to overshoot it. Can use the power on the exit to help speed the car up. Pull right to the grass again. Come through the second corner. Grab a lot of the grass on the inside, but nearly flat out there. Hanging the rear end out, just like I said I wasn't going to do, but now up to third gear. V12 roaring away in front. All right, down to second gear. Come to the left-hander here. Nice on entry. It felt quick coming in, but I was able to get the car turned there. Now towards the flint wall, second gear. Keep it in second, actually, this time. Oh, it's got a lot of power when we don't have to worry about the revs. Fly through the right-hander there. Just a little bit sideways, much more composed than last time. Now towards the line. Get it up to third gear here through the left-hander. Come to the finish line. What's it gonna be? Oh, and a 106.750. Oh man. Now that's quick. That's the quickest time. I beat the Fiat. Is that driving? Admittedly, I have driven this car much more than some of the others, but it just turns so well. I hope you could see turning into corners. It just grips up much better than the other cars do. A little more like the Voisson. Uh, maybe something about the French, I don't know, but man, quickest car overall. Did not expect that beating the Fiat. So it wins the beauty contest and the talent competition, but might have been driving, might be because I have a little bit more experience in this car than the others, just because it's so so gorgeous and a fun one to drive. But uh, you can see it's a very comparable car to the Fiat, but a totally different approach, a supercharged inline eight versus a V12, not supercharged. Uh, definitely the Fiat has more power and at like a Monza, I could imagine that being a, an easy win if it can stay in one piece. But around a turny circuit, curvy circuit, the V12 still has a lot of power and this car suspension, everything just handles so much better. So, so far the victory goes to the Delange, but we have one more car to go. And so last and maybe least is the Roland Pillion A22. And like Nice Cup of Tea says, it's not necessarily the grand finale we we're all expecting, but it is the last missing piece of this 1923 Grand Prix. And I don't know if this car is actually the slowest 
out of the lot. So it'll be interesting to see that. I think it's quite a bit off the fastest. If we look at it, it's 97 horsepower out of a straight eight. So the Fiat itself is putting out almost 40 more horsepower. Uh, even the Delange that we just raced to the fastest time, you know, is, is 15 or almost 20 more horsepower than this car. So not enough power out of a straight eight. It's also the heaviest car by far. And that's probably what's hurting it the most. Uh, it's 832 kilograms, uh, over 130 more than the Delange we just raced. So uh, that itself is going to really weigh it down, for lack of a better word, and won't be able to accelerate and move through the corners as fast. But yeah, it's still more of a conventional looking Grand Prix car. It was a proven design. It did win races. Uh, so it's not necessarily a bad car, but compared to the other cars of the event, uh, was not the speediest overall. All right, we'll come to the start line. And actually, one thing I noticed about this that I hadn't up until this point is that it's a left-hand drive car. All the rest of them are right-hand drive. And I know France, I think, was split on the matter, but interesting enough. Hand is up, down, we're underway. <laughs> Not enough horsepower to get a lot of wheel spin there off the line, but away we go, first gear, get up to second gear, come towards the first corner. Dip it on in. Oh, it feels a little bit like a boat. It's not dramatically heavier than the rest of them, but it certainly is comparably heavy. Skip it over the curb there on the inside, though. Now flat out under the Goodwood Bridge. I don't think we'll have quite enough time to get up to third gear, although we'll get close to the red line for it. But now I'll slow it on down for welcome. There we go. Second gear still. Almost had to get down to first there, but that would be very uncomfortable. But head towards Flint now. Just a slight breath of the throttle as we come in. Not very dramatic, especially compared to the Delange and Fiat. A little more well-behaved. Come through the right-hander there, nice and quick. This felt like a pretty good run up the hill. A non-corner here to the left, and we'll come towards the line, but I can see the clock ticking away. There goes the top times. Will we come in anywhere above that? Oh, and a 111.356. Oh, and it's just slightly slower than the Bugatti, so it's the slowest car so far uh, by, what is that, four one-thousandths of a second. Uh, but, man, that's actually quite encouraging. So around this track up the hill, uh, it's about as quick as the Bugatti so far, but it didn't feel like the perfect lap. It felt pretty good, but can I go even a little bit quicker? And so this car is not the slowest overall. So the end of my lap that time felt pretty good. So it's going to all be about the start of the lap and whether or not we can get through this starting area quick. But stop at the line, hand is up, down, we're underway. Still not able to get wheel spin. I tried that time, but we'll accelerate away. Wait for the shifting point. There we go, up to second gear. Try not to go too deep into the corner, but just get her on in back on the accelerator. Can we go quickly through here? Oh, turn it in, hop over the edge of the pavement once again. Doing that with almost every car, but now flat out. We'll keep it in second. It's just second gear pretty much the whole way up. We'll almost redline it once again. Stab the brakes. There we go. Get it on through the corner. Back on the throttle. Not a lot more in the car. It's just all about trying to keep the speed up, really. Come through Flint. Kept it flat that time, but had the lift on the exit slightly just to make sure we were going to run wide. Come now through the right-hander here, the kink, right to the hay bales. Maybe take a little hay with us. But flat now, come towards the line. Can we be just a little bit quicker than the Bugatti? 109, 110, 111, whoa, a 111.389, so no, it's actually slower than the last lap through. Uh, it's funny, felt almost quicker, but yeah, what we expected from the start, the Roland Pillion, uh, it's a great looking car, but not the quickest itself up the hill. So a bit more of a lumbering beast, but all in all, definitely not a bad car. Uh, comparable, at least in this setting, to the Bugatti. Have to wonder if I was to go do the Bugatti again, maybe I could be even a little bit quicker. Uh, I think this car is firmly 
the slowest of the bunch, but it's not dramatically slower. Uh, and maybe even on a straight line would be decently good, especially compared to maybe the Vlasson, who's quite slow in a straight line. So interesting car overall. Fun little competition there, though. So in the final results, the Roland Pillion, the slowest car out of all of them, uh, but still quite a competitive time, a 111.356, only four one thousandths slower than the Bugatti Type 32. Uh, very different car designs. It's crazy to see the approach to the problem. The Bugatti just doesn't have the grunt that it needs, uh, but it would be great in a straight line with the slip streaming. The Roland Pillion, much more uh, conventional designs, just too heavy. Uh, for the car that it is. Both cars actually too heavy, so the weight is one of the biggest things that matter. Uh, but those two cars at the bottom, the Voisson, a little bit quicker, but honestly a lot slower than I thought it was going to be overall. So a 110.225, it's a wider car, much lower to the ground. Uh, it's just hurting in the horsepower with only 78 horsepower. It's just not powerful enough to outdrag the rest. Uh, at the top, we've got the three most conventional looking cars, also lighter cars, very comparable, all three designs. You could honestly race these online, and I think it would come out most of the time to the better driver, unless it's a really fast track uh, where the Fiat would come out on top. But the Sunbeam uh, with the 107095, the Fiat with a 106.839. And then the Delange 2 LCV, my favorite car, uh, maybe a little bit biased here, but a 106.750, the fastest of them all. So, so this is an awesome set of cars. Nice Cup of Tea has done such a great job with all of these, especially from the materials that are available to actually develop something like this. A lot of it's just grainy photographs and uh, Nice Cup of Tea says in the description for the Roland Pillion that the, some of the designing work that he got, some of the papers and everything actually contradict each other on the cars. So it's a little bit of guesswork, uh, a lot of fun though to, to race the cars and uh, comparing all of them to one another. I think I'll come back at some point and do an actual race, but definitely we'll take suggestions. If anybody has tracks, that would be good for these or thoughts on tracks, that would be good for them. Uh, hopefully at some point the tour circuit itself actually comes out. I don't think it would be the most exciting track, but because we have all six of the cars and all the liveries and everything that raced in the 1923 French Grand Prix, we just have to have the circuit, don't we? So can cross my fingers for that. But until then, we have a great set of cars for it. Not sure what Nice Cup of Tea is going to be up to next now that you know he's completed the whole set. Hopefully something good, but I hope you enjoyed this. A little bit of fun, not too serious, just to compare the cars. Uh, I definitely learned a lot about their characteristics during it and I'm eager to go try them out on other circuits. So I thank you for watching. I'll see you all again next time.